Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for bringing us to this point where this workers retreat that we started a few nights ago can come to a conclusion. We thank you for all that we have learned already. And thank you for the privileges and opportunities you gave us to pray. And we thank you because you've done something in our hearts. We pray that what you have done will abide and continue with every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we pray that we'll no more do things that are displeasing unto you, but that as you have made a full revelation of yourself to us, and we have come to a new realization, and you have definitely touched our hearts of life calls from the altar, you have revived us. You have renewed us. We pray, o Lord, that as you recommission us now, so that we can go back to our various places and do your will, obey your word, do your work, grant us the strength in Jesus' name. We pray, o Lord, that the things you have corrected in our lives will remain corrected and the pollution and uncleanness and the evidence of going back into the world which you have revealed unto us now that you have cleansed us transformed us we pray O lord will not go back into our vomit again in jesus name we're asking that this moment again you speak to us in Jesus' name we pray. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we read from verse 1. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing, and his kingdom preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove rebuke exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and it shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables but watch thou in all things endure afflictions do the work of an evangelist make full proof of thy ministry for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but to all them also, that love is appearing. As we come to the close of the workers' retreat, it becomes necessary for us to be reminded of what we're going to do as we go back. Here were the parting words of Paul the Apostle to Timothy, a minister of the Word of God in those days. And in outlining these parting words, he told Timothy what he would have to do. And first of all, he called on Timothy. And he said he was bringing this charge or this commission to Timothy. Because of the Lord and before the Lord. 
And he reminded this young man that this God, through Jesus Christ, will judge the living and the dead when he appears. And he says, because of that, because of the judgment, preach the word. That then must tell this young minister that the judgment of ministers will include the evaluation of their preaching. That the judgment of ministers will include the examination and the judgment of their preaching. Before, because they just said, I'm giving you this charge before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead, the quick and the dead that is appearing. And immediately then he says, on the basis of that judgment, because of knowing that that judgment is definite and sure, preach the word. Because your life alone will not be what will come on the line to be examined on that final day by the word you preach. Preach the word. Then he told Timothy, being a man of experience himself, who had passed through wonderful times as well as difficult times. Being a man of experience himself, who had passed through when it was convenient and when it wasn't convenient. So he told this young minister, he said, there will be times that it will appear it is out of season, inconvenient, difficulties all surrounding. Then he said there will be times, thank God, it will seem like this is a season. Everything will be convenient. But then he says, in season or out of season, convenient or not convenient, happy or sad, sick or healthy, persecuted or praised, preach the word. Preach the word. Because there is nothing else that can save. It is this engrafted word that we receive that can save the soul. Preach the word because there is no other instrument or danger of God to change lives and transform lives. Preach the word because there is no other thing that so influences and affects the heart of man. Preach the word. Because there is no other thing that God himself has exalted above his name except the word. Preach the word. Because all the things you see now will definitely pass away. And it is this word of the gospel which will preach unto you that will endure forever. Preach the word. Because heaven and earth shall pass away. It is this enduring, eternal, everlasting, infallible word that will remain ever and ever. Preach the word because this is what Jesus Christ himself died for so that we can be recipients of the word and then we can be givers of the word out to people. Preach the word because there is no other thing that Satan will fight more than this word. If he will fight anything, he will fight the word. Preach the word because this is the sword of the spirit you can put in the hands of the believers to overcome temptation, overcome trial, overcome whatever may come in their lives. Preach the word because this word of God is that lever of water by which we are washed. Ye are clean through the word which has spoken unto you. Preach the word. When you think about it, it is the greatest work that anybody can do. And so he told young Timothy, says you'll find other ministers getting interested in other things apart from preaching the word you'll find other ministers that have been called they will think that this is a new field and this is an innovation and this is something that is more interesting but he says keep to the word and preach the word then he says as you preach the word in season and out of season sometimes you'll have to stand up preaching the word and thank God there will be seasons when you will be bold. And you will preach the word. But notice that there are times when you will be trembling. But then you still have to preach the word. Thank God there are times when you will, fight, when you will have a good congregation. Congregations of people that say like Cornelius. And 
since the angel spoke to me, I sent to you. And now we are all seated here to hear what is to be declared of you from the Lord. Thank God there are times to have wonderful congregations that will say, Give us this word. Thou hast the word of eternal life. To whom shall we go in season? But then he said, Timothy, you know what? There are times you have congregations of people that will grit their teeth and gnash their teeth and frown at you and almost want to tear you into pieces. It says, at such a time when it is out of season, preach the word. You know, Paul was speaking from experience. There were times he got to places and they just received the word. The burying. So after receiving the word, they even examined, searching the word daily, seeing that those things were so. But then there were other times they preached the word and they said, Away with this fellow, it's not right that he should live. And so he said, Timothy, you're welcome to situations in season, convenient, out of season, inconvenient. But what are you supposed to do? Preach the word. And Timothy, you'll need to reprove. Still with the word, you will need to rebuke, steal with the word, and then exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. It says, even when you rebuke, stick to the word. When you reprove and correct, stick to the word. When you exhort and encourage, stick to the word with all long suffering and doctrine. It said, Timothy, this is what you will need. This is what shows whether a person is called of God or not. Long suffering. Because, Timothy, the temptation will come for you to say, transfer me out of this place. This is difficult land. I preach, I pray, I fast. But the people are not yielding enough. Timothy, there are times you are going to wonder whether I can continue with this congregation because you will counsel, you will care, you will pray, you will do everything and it appears that they are not as fast as you want them to be. It says you will have to exhort with long suffering and stay in that same congregation and stay in that same assembly, still preaching the word. There are times the devil will come to ask you, after all, all that you have been preaching to this location where you are, have they received all, all the word? Isn't there a greener field outside? A better congregation somewhere else? And somewhere I can go where I can preach the word and 3,000 will get converted in one day and all the city will rejoice because of the things I've done. It says, stay where you are with all long suffering. Preach the word, reprove. If they don't accept the reprove, reprove again. If they have not corrected everything, reprove again. And rebuke if you need to. And exhort and encourage and instruct the people. But then if they have not taken the correction immediately, don't scatter the church because of that. Long suffering. And don't scatter yourself and destroy yourself because I don't know why the people are not listening to me. I don't know what has happened. Long suffering. Don't seek for transfer out of that place. Long suffering. Don't compare your ministry with the ministry of the other fellow. You know, so and so became this and became that at the same time with me. Or even I started preaching before him. I started district work before him. I started zonal work before him. A son is progressing, my own is not progressing. This is stony ground. Well, somebody has to be there. This is ground that is by the wayside. Somebody has to be there. These are difficult people. Jesus died for them. These people, I don't understand them. Preach the gospel to every creature. Somebody has to be there to preach the gospel. And if you are the one that is there, exhort them with all long suffering and doctrine. Then it says, he said, young minister, do you know this? The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. The time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. Repentance before salvation. That's too much for them. Restitution to show that you really have known the Lord. And if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember somebody has something against you, leave your gift there. You leave your um, trumpet there and leave your violin there. And then you go back and reconcile with the person that, has offended, that you have offended, that has something against you. Don't go on singing. 
Don't go on playing instrument and don't go on evangelizing and don't go on ushering and don't go on cleaning the church and don't go on this and that without settling, reconciling with the people that you have offended. It says there are times when some people will not accept that. And he will say, no, I'm going to play my violin. Whether people have something against me or not, I'm going to worship, I'm going to serve. Whether God is going to accept my service or not, I like to do it. Whether it is having record, good record in heaven or not, I want to do it. It says you leave that thing and then go and reconcile. There is a time coming when the people will not endure sound doctrine. You know, times are coming when, if you get into any of the association of ministers in your location, and uh, you know you stand up to say one man one wife the other ministers are going to say eject him out of this place it's going to bring division into our association of ministers because you know this uh, fellow once he begins to bring bible now we're not going to be united again and all these other ministers that are coming from this and that they're not going to listen again it says the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine and you will see it from their attitude. He said, young minister, don't look at their attitude and don't look at their action. Just preach the word in season and out of season. He said, the time is coming when they will not endure the fact that holiness is the most essential, indispensable thing. That the time will come when the people will not understand, will not accept that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And now, when the people in your location, in your locality, when you say, holiness, 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 and then you find somebody just closes his Bible and, you know, does not read Bible again, looking at you like this, what do you do? You keep on preaching it. Or when somebody, you preach holiness, 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 it's that time that, you know, one person there will just rise up and go to the toilet. It's that time that somebody will rise up and go and do another thing. Just showing to you that they don't accept what you are saying. They want another thing. What do you then? He said, young minister, keep on preaching it. Know that it's the time I spoke about that has come. That the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They will not accept the word of God. And you know, sometimes when I look at even this church, I wonder whether we now can abide with sound doctrine. I read the words of Jesus Christ that says if they slap you on the one cheek, you fold your hand, you turn the other. And then he slaps the second one too. And if he's still not happy, not enough, you sla he slaps the other. And Jesus said, you don't take him to court. Jesus said, you don't fight back. Jesus said, you don't even abuse him. Jesus said, all you can do is to be praying for him. I wonder whether we can still endure sound doctrine. Jesus Christ said, as part of sound doctrine, he said, you will never retaliate. You will never revenge. It says, if anybody will take your coat, let him take your cloak also, and give it to him voluntarily and say, God bless you. It doesn't say, go and look for a gun and shoot him. It doesn't say, go and look for the best lawyer in your church and take him to court. It doesn't say that when somebody has taken money from you or has done this, has done that, what you are to do now is to get this and get this and get this. I think even this church is not enduring sound doctrine. That now we cannot endure trial. We cannot endure difficulty. We cannot endure cheating. If people want to cheat us now, we don't accept. We say I'm a child of God and nobody can cheat me. And the way some of you are looking at me, I guess you've never read some of these things I'm telling you in the Bible. And here we are deep alive. And we have been here for since Wednesday night. And then sound doctrine now comes. We we'll say, is that in the Bible? You better believe it. It is in the Bible. He even says, if somebody will force you to go a mile, what are we to do? I wait to say no, not on your life, not me. I will not take nonsense from anybody. The Bible does not. It says go with that mile. And when you go with that, uh, that mile, you still stay there and say, can I go an extra mile with you? You know what it means? What it means is that those days, there were soldiers, the Roman army in Israel. And then they will have a big load. And then they will just see somebody and say, come here, carry that load. And the fellow had where he wanted to go before. But this soldier will force this individual to carry this load. Jesus said, if you are my disciple, 
if you are a child of God, if you are born again, don't say, not me. Gently, forget where you wanted to go before. Carry that load. Follow me. Begin to follow him. That's Christianity. That's how we know Christians. No fighting back. No retaliation. No rebellion. No quarreling. Here we are. You see a pregnant woman. Not a soldier. Not a Roman soldier. And it's, uh, you know, very heavy with child. Almost going to deliver this afternoon. And then has a very heavy load. And you are a young girl. Nothing has happened to your body. You are strong. You can shout. You can jump. And this, um, you know, pregnant woman said, ah, My sister, come. What's that? Ah, come now. Help me. You see my condition? Help me to carry this load. I cannot carry it. In fact, since I got down from the bus and I got to this place, the way I'm breathing now is like I should even sit down on the road here. Help me, my sister, to carry this thing and carry it there. Me? You have a slave here? Didn't you bring your maid? Your husband who gave you the pregnancy cannot follow you and come and carry load? Me, I came for workers' retreat. Don't, don't let the devil cheat me from this workers' retreat. <laughs> Christians. But Jesus said you carry that thing. And you go a mile. And when you finish, you say, Sister, any other assignment? Any other thing I will do? And she says, no, it's all right. Are you sure it's all right? Can I go now? You release me? That's Christianity. The Christianity we met in the Bible. But the Bible says, the time shall come. When they will not endure sound doctrine. Then what will happen after that? It says... After their own laws, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They will say, I prefer that teacher. I prefer that preacher. This is the one. There is somebody that preaches over television. Don't tell people, no, because they told us not to use television. But I'm telling you, there is somebody there that preaches over television. In fact, if you see their choir on that television, if you see the way they enjoy the Lord and the fellowship and the singing, me, I will tell you, I watch that thing, oh, I see that thing. Hey, and you are walking in the cheeky keep quiet. Uh, is it everything they tell us in district that you will do? If you do everything they are telling us, just like that. Uh, so that's how you are doing your own. Me, I watch it. For, come to my house Saturday evening. I about workers meeting. I say, come to my house. You will like it if I show you. There you are. Walker. But it says after their own laws, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They want to hear story. They want to hear this. They want to hear that sound doctrine they are not interested in. Then it said, they will turn away their ears from the truth. You see all the truths of the word of God we're emphasizing. They will turn away their ears. They say, no, that is too hard. No divorce and remarriage. If you have divorced, you will go to search for your first wife. You will do restitution. And if you have done restitution, and maybe you have, the, you have been the second wife or the third wife, and you have done restitution, and there is no man coming at present, you don't uh, run after a particular man. Hey, I had a dream. And in this dream, it is this man. It is this man running after that man. And if the man, when the man is coming to Bible study, there you are, you are waiting on the road, and you just double cross him. Brother, how about that matter now? What matter? I'm going to Bible study. Let me go. To... No, I about that matter. You are rebelling against God. You are not obeying God. It's because I married before. And, it, and God said he's going to judge you. Are you the one that is to tell him of that judgment? And after the Bible study, uh, you know, maybe the pastor mentioned the will of God is very important. We should take the will of God. Whatever the will of God is, we should just abide by the will of God. Immediately after the Bible study, you go to him again. Have you got the answer now? Did you hear? God was speaking. So, you didn't hear that the pastor was saying. God was speaking to you. Will bring confusion. And all that is in her heart is that I will make this man to marry me by all means. Because maybe it's because I made a resolution. It's not thinking about me. But I know it is the will of God. It says, they themselves. They will turn their ears away from the truth. And then they will be turned onto fables. Stories. Dreams trance revelation i saw this i saw this it's what they'll be turned on to then it said but watch thou in all things endure affliction that's the cross 
You wonder why I'm looking at this passage like this? It's because it has the cross there. It has the conquering there. It has the crown there. Here it says, endure affliction. It says you will need to carry your cross. You will need to take up your cross. You will need to bear your cross. You will need to endure. Afflictions will come. Persecution will come. Insult will come. A lot of things will come. But you will endure afflictions. And in that affliction, in the midst of those afflictions, keep on doing the work of an evangelist. And make full proof of thy ministry. Full proof of thy ministry. Stay where you are and let God know that you have really accepted the ministry though it may be a difficult ministry then he said i am now ready i've conquered he said timothy young man i am now ready to be off uh, to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand he said in fact the cross i carry i'm ready to carry it to the point of death he said the cross i carry i'm ready i'm willing to lay my very life down because of this thing he said i'm now ready to be offered what was paul talking about you know paul was a jewish fellow before he became converted he was a pharisee of the tribe of benjamin and he knew he knew how animals were offered and in his mind he could see an animal being taken and taken to the slaughter and they will just kill that animal and shed its blood and then that animal will die as he saw that in his mind he said timothy i can picture the animal and i can see the animal being taken and i can see it being slaughtered and being killed and i'm ready for that now i'm ready to even die i've carried the cross it's not convenient but the grace of god makes me to enjoy it Maybe there is a cross like that in your life. And you are trying to avoid the cross. And you are trying to run away from the cross. It says, I am even ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. Then it said in verse 7, Do you see the spirit of a conqueror here? The spirit of an overcomer. The spirit of a person who knew beyond a shadow of doubt that he was going to make it. He said, I have fought a good fight. Oh, Paul the Apostle, he fought. I fought a good fight. And when you think about the life of Paul the Apostle, the things that he needed to fight against, he said, Timothy, I fought a good fight. You know, when he was converted, immediately became converted. Three days and three nights, he didn't eat, he didn't do anything, only praying. And God said, and then I asked, go to him. Behold, he prayed. That man was already wrestling at the point, the moment he became saved. Already wrestling and praying. I fought a good fight. And then, right in Damascus there, they wanted to even kill him. The very first week or the first month, he became converted. And they had to use a basket to transport him and get him on the side of the world. I fought a good fight. He got to Jerusalem. Think about this man. And then when he got to Jerusalem, even though he had met the Lord, all the disciples said, Ah, Saul, this is the new style. The new trick. He wants to mix with the believers and then be able to arrest all the believers and kill them or send them to the prison. And eventually Barnabas came and said, this man has been converted. He met the Lord on the way to Damascus. He had even preached the Lord in Damascus. And then when they said that, okay, they opened the door to him and he was coming in and coming out with them. They were watching him. That man had to fight for even being accepted. And eventually, you know, his missionary journey. You know the, you know, you know the time that he got to that... Uh, so I just Pilos, the governor, and then the sorcerer, wanting to divert the minister, the minister from the word of God, he had to fight against that also. And all the various things that came in his life, shipwreck, and also beating, and the scourging, and the false brethren, and the lies that came against him. And when you think about that man, he was never, never, never discouraged. That was the time he said, we are pressed, even unto death. But thank God, he said, the Lord that always gives us triumph, that man fought. He said, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. He looked back, he said, is there anything for me still to do? Any epistle to write? Any message to preach? Any journey to go? Anyone to counsel? 
He said something that God wrote down many years ago when he called me. That I should do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. Is there anyone remaining that I have not done? Is there any trial I still need to endure? Is there any cross I still need to bear? Is there something that I missed out in the, at the time of my weakness, at the time of discouragement, at the time of carelessness? Anything I missed out? He said, Timothy, I searched myself. I told the Spirit of God to search me. I found nothing. I've now finished my course. Can you say that? Can you say that? That since you came to know the Lord, that all the people that you needed to touch, but discouragement will not allow you. All the things that you need to do, personal problem, will not allow you. All the songs you need to sing, personal disagreement, will not allow you. All the evangelism you needed to do, looking for money, will not allow you. Can you say like Paul the Apostle, the voice of the conqueror, I have finished my cause. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. Thank God he kept the faith. Because you see, that's the advantage we have today. If you want to know the contents of the faith, now you can go to these epistles written by Paul the Apostle through inspiration and you can get the faith. I have kept the faith. You know, there are some people, they cannot keep the faith. Keep the faith. If they see a new idea, a new opinion, a new ideology, a new doctrine, they cannot keep the faith. But he said, I have kept the faith. The crown. Now in verse 8. Henceforth, that is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. See the assurance of this man. See the certainty with which he spoke. He said, young man, henceforth, now that everything is finished, I've preached, and many people have been saved, I've done everything that I ought to do, and there was long suffering, there was endurance, and I stayed where I should have stayed. He said, now, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. You see, there are some people that are not even sure of going to heaven. Not to talk of winning a crown. But Paul the apostle said, when I die, let nobody doubt where I have gone. I'm going to heaven. He said, when I go, let nobody doubt whether I will have reward or not. In fact, he said, a crown of righteousness is waiting for me there. Can you say that? Can you say that? With the ups and downs, can you say that? In today, out tomorrow, can you say that? Committed today, not com non-commitment tomorrow, can you say that? And agile today, active today, but slow and sluggish and lukewarm tomorrow, can you say that? Today you are dependable, tomorrow you are not trustworthy, can you say that? And you, you know, your, your service depends on your mood. Your mood is good, you serve well. Your mood is not good, you don't serve well. Can you say that? But you see this, Paul the Apostle, he said, now... A crown of righteousness is laid up for me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me. At that day, then he said, not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. The cross, the conqueror, and the crown. The cross. First of all, you need to have the cross cancel out your sin. And that is what we have been talking about since we came. That in order to be saved, in order to come to the kingdom of God, the cross of Jesus Christ will have to cancel out your sin. Because it is on the cross that Jesus Christ died. So that he will save you from all your sins. But then that's just the beginning of the effect of the cross upon your life. The effect of the cross continues. You begin to glory in that cross. You begin to delight in that cross. In Galatians chapter 6. And verse 14, God forbid that I should glory save except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. God forbid that I should glory in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul the Apostle looked at all the things he had, and he looked at all the advantages he had naturally. And he looked at all the things he had as an educated, civilized person. As a person that was above his equals in the land of Israel. 
as he bundled everything together you know what he said after that he said but what things were gained unto me those i counted loss for christ he said now i cannot go in glory in my certificate i cannot glory in my natural profession i cannot glory anymore now in my tribe in my being a pharisee before in the place i in society before there's only one thing i glory in now and it is the cross of jesus christ have you come to that point in your life where the cross means everything in your life your profession doesn't mean anything your natural ability doesn't mean anything and all that you have achieved in life doesn't mean anything and what people think of you what people see of you doesn't mean anything and what you think you have from the family line from your background doesn't mean anything anymore my village my village my town my town doesn't mean anything anymore and my own personal ambition i want to achieve this i want to achieve that doesn't mean anything anymore that these are my colleagues in the world you know that graduate you know that in fact do you remember do you know that this is a governor in that state and that's it do you know that they were our classmates together that doesn't mean anything anymore because all that means anything now is the cross of jesus christ you need to come to that position where you exalt the cross and you lift up the cross above every other thing he said but god forbid that i should glory except in the cross of our lord jesus christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and i crucified unto the world that means now that you have come to the lord jesus christ the world is crucified unto you all the pop singing in the world you don't even think about it all the systems of the world you don't even think about it the things that bring joy to the people of the world they're all crucified to you and in fact when somebody is really born again really born again and you must understand i come from a different world i come from the world of the bible and i come with immersing my mind and my brain and my heart and my spirit and my personality everything immersing it into the bible i don't know other thing i come from a different area from many people you see when some people think about the things of the world and they talk about the things of the world and they are so jubilant about it and they say i have a hard time giving up this i have a hard time giving up this i don't understand i don't understand because you see when you are immersed in this word of god all these things they do in the world in fact everything i see in the world immediately comes to me almost unconsciously that the devil is the god of this world if i see any style in the world if i see of any new kind of music immediately i know that the devil is a god of this world he's the one that controls the system and the custom and the music and, and the politics and everything that goes on the devil is a god of this world and because of that any of those things they don't even hold any interest for me any interest at all the things that some of the people of the world will think are interesting they will think are wonderful they don't hold any interest at all why because through the cross of jesus christ the world is crucified unto you and you see sometimes uh, uh, believers uh, when they say you know somebody died and normally in our custom this is what they do and say is that your custom if you are born again is that your custom if you are a child of god is that your custom if you are now in the kingdom of god is that your custom you know sometimes uh, it's well it shows that those people they really don't have what the bible calls salvation they say somebody died in our district and this person that died in our district it is our custom that this person cannot be buried in lagos the person will be carried far far to where there is no road where there is no sea where there is no river you have to carry the coffin on the head after you get to where the bus or the vehicle will take you far back in the village and then you will go the past mile they say can we bury the person no no our custom will not allow and then all the people that say that that is their custom in that district or that locality they will be watching they will say if they don't bury this person according to our custom and all the people in the zone all the people in the district they must leave bible study and leave revival hour and leave workers meeting on saturday and leave the sunday worship and go far far into the village 
and eventually when they get there all that those people will do apart from idol worship we must do everything and keep this day and keep this day and keep this day if we don't do that all of us they begin to have meeting we're leaving this church we're leaving this church uh -uh. what's the use of being in the church when if you are in the church and one of us dies they are not going to do all that they need to do those people are not born again those people are not born again in fact you know what I don't worry about some of these people that say, I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave. Because, you see, they were not even part of the church originally. They are just visitors. They are not part of the people of God. And nobody can threaten the church and say, if you don't bury us this way, we are going to leave. We say bye-bye. And you know, sometimes when they leave, they go back to the Catholic church. They go back to Sele, they go back to this, they go back to that. They say, uh, because that is when we die, those people, they will bury us well, well. They will bury you well, well, but you go to hell. And the rich man died. And he was buried. Oh, they buried that man well, well. But then immediately they buried him well. In fact, before they buried him well, well, he opened up his eyes, lit up his eyes in hell. And said, Father Abraham. I am tormented in this place. Ah, rich man, why are you tormented? But you have been buried well, well. Well, well, burial did not, uh, did not save him from hell. But there was another man that died. And nobody could bury him well, well. His name Lazarus. And Lazarus died. The poor man, the beggar. The one that had no relative. The one that had no family. The one that had no counselor. The one that had no helper. And Lazarus died. The beggar. The one that even the rich man will not give anything. And when he was trying to pick the crumbs, even the dogs will come and lick his soul. And that Lazarus died. You know what happened? And the angels took him. For the rich man, the angel said, that one, let devil take his property. But Lazarus, Lazarus, no zonal leader, no area leader, no selection of days and days to carry him to our little, little village. But the angels carried him and carried him right into Abraham's bosom. And when they got over there, the rich man, he said, what? Conditions have changed, yes? Even the people of the world tell us no condition is permanent. If you are rich, no condition is permanent. If you are popular, no condition is permanent. If you are like the rich man, no condition. Death is going to change that thing. No condition is permanent. If you are Lazarus, there's no money, there's no accommodation. Remember, please, no condition is permanent. And Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. Everything had changed. And the rich man looked at him and said, I know this one. This one will help me. But he didn't help him when they were in the world here. He said, Father Abraham, help me talk to Lazarus. To come over to this side, deep his finger in water. This place is terrible. I'm tormented in this plane. Oh, he said, son, remember, in the world, you had your own good time. And now you are tormented and he is comforted. Not only that, there's a great God between you and us that nobody can pass from here to there. Do you know that that man suffered after he was buried? And there are people today that, you know, you are fighting for. They must bury them this way and bury them this way. And the church must do this and the church must do that. We're not thinking of their salvation. We're not thinking of, is this person really born again? If he's born again, then he has gone to heaven. Why are we fighting over his dead body? If he's a child of God, he's gone to heaven. Why are we fighting over whether they bury him according to our custom? They carry him to village or not? They choose all these people from our district. I want to tell you that when you look at the New Testament, we don't see all these uh, kind of emphasis on burial, 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 burial. After all, if the person has gone to heaven, what else do you want to do for him? And if the person has not gone to heaven, what else are you going to do for him? In fact, it says, you can spend all the money you want to spend, but you know, here am I, here he is in hell. And what are you going to do for him to take him out of that hell? The most important thing for a child of God is that before people die, we preach salvation to them. Being born again to them. And after they have died, praise the Lord, if they are children of God, they have gone. And angels have carried them already to Abraham's bosom. Whatever else is done or not done, let's leave that in the hands of God. And it says... It is by this cross I am crucified to the world. When you are a real child of God, you are crucified to all the systems and the customs and all the things they're doing in the world. You know, we have some, they call them sisters. And they say, 
this uh, jewelry. In fact, I'm thinking of which church to really stay. Because I don't want to deceive myself. When I go to the office and I dress, look at me now. I mean, and I know who I am. Who are you? I know what I used to be. What were you before? What were you before? Were you going America before? I know what, where I used to go. Where were you going before? Don't brag about nothing. And then eventually we'll say, after all, that church is really right there. After all, they're all Christians. How do you know they're all Christians? And they wear this, and they wear that. In fact, in fact, I see some of them wearing slacks, and they are smart, and they go to this their church. And one day I was even in that their church. I wanted to see, to compare. And those people, the love of God there, the fellowship there, the joy of the Lord there, that wonderful music there. When I, then I came back to our church, I saw the way we were singing, just sitting down or just standing up. And in fact, it, not to tell you lie, that place, their fellowship there, <laughs> if you go there, you will enjoy. Well, you enjoy fellowship, but there's no doctrine. Enjoy fellowship, but there's no teaching of the word of God. And all the dancing and the drumming and all the music of the world they bring in. That's why you are saying, my mind is thinking, whether to stay here or to go there. Well, you are not born again. Whether you are here or you are there is the same story. All we will lose is that the usher will lose the count. It will be less by two or three. That's all we lose. In the kingdom of God, there is no difference because your name was not in the book of life. When you are born again, you are a child of God. Paul the apostle said, through that cross of Jesus Christ, I am crucified to the world and the world is crucified unto me. You are not interested in any of those things anymore. They just don't interest you. Just like, I mean, these things don't interest me. In fact, I, when I see a woman with, you know, all the, all the lotions of the world and all the things, I even pity them. Uh, you know, a man, and sometimes the men, I'm sorry for the men. I'm sorry for the men. A man, you know, came to my office. And a man is supposed to be a Christian. A man is supposed to be a worker in deeper life. And he sat in front of me. And uh, so I said, you use something that is smelling so terribly. Oh, he, he smiled and said, it is this kind of lotion. I said, who are you using it for? You're a married man? That even the sisters, I don't, I don't sense that kind of smell. And here you are as a man. What's the matter with you? He said, I will wash it off. I said, quickly, throw that in away. Don't use it again. Well, you are crucified to the world. And the world is crucified to you. You say, what? You say, is it to that extent? It's even much more than that extent. So you didn't know before? You didn't know that this word of God will make all those customs of the world, all those appearances of the world, you will be crucified unto them and the world will be crucified unto you. And then you say, what kind of people shall we be if we take all these things away? We'll be heavenly minded people. And wouldn't that be wonderful? I said, wouldn't that be wonderful? If the whole of the world is crucified unto you and you are totally crucified to the world and when the world tries to print you like this you have died you don't even have any feeling and when all these uh, women that are wearing all these things uh, you know in your office and come to your desk and taps your desk and says this and that you look up like this you are shocked you say look at this masquerade when did masquerade get to my office and then you say masquerade god deliver me and the woman runs out I will go and tell all the other ladies and said that man is not a man of this world again. That man has God. They cannot trip you anymore. They cannot trick you anymore. Because now you are a real child of God. I pray that when you leave this workers retreat, you will never be the same in Jesus' name. And those other people that have been trying to think they can trick you, they can trip you, they can attract you. All those things don't attract a real child of God. In fact, you know, sometimes uh, uh, when they tell me, they say a particular brother, they say he backslid. And then I, after he backslid, they said he went to marry somebody that is not a real believer. And sometimes I say, okay, let me even see them. And then this fellow will come and, you know, with his new wife and, you know, come and missing and moving like this. He's happy. He's, he doesn't know himself. And then eventually he sits down. And then they, I thought the person that the fellow went to marry, I thought that, uh, you know, the fellow is still somewhere. And then both of them sit down. And, uh, you know, he said, I'm the one that the coordinator reported that I went to marry. And not in our church here. 
So I try to control myself and I say, well, uh, who is that person you married? And he says, this is that my beloved wife. And I look at that thing that is sitting down there. And I say this, in my mind, I say this one. This, be, this you see why you backslid this one? It's the thing that made you to backslide. Then I just say, okay, uh, you know, don't run away. Uh, the hearing the word of God. And uh, you woman, <laughs> where are you coming from? Welcome. Uh, please, uh, they will tell you about salvation. Make sure that you are born again. And then in my mind, I look at the man and say, look at this man. Even if somebody is going to backslide. Eh? A person will backslide eating cockroach. A person will backslide because of lizard. That, eh, they didn't give me enough meat. They, if, you, if somebody is going to go away from the gospel, it's because of somebody that, ah, God delivers. When you are a child of God, all these uh, people in the world, I'm sorry for them. You are crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to you. And your eyes are the eyes of heaven. And when you see, like, you see beauty, you know beauty. Not all this one that they are carrying about and they call beauty. May the spirit of God anoint your eyes. So that you will be able to see. And you will see that all these things they are carrying, them, carrying about in the world. You are crucified to the world. And the world is crucified to you. In fact, those people of the world, they will never come near. I remember before I got married. I mean, long, long ago now. That my relatives were, they, they were very concerned. Because this man had come out of university. And days and days. And then they became serious. And uh, you know, one day one of them said... All right, we know what we're going to do. Call me by my first name. And say, what we're going to do is that we're going to bring a woman. And we will know what you will do. I said, bring her. That that's the reason the policemen are there. Outside. We don't arrest believers. We arrest unbelievers. That I will, I will hand over that person to the police. And find out what, he came to, what she came to do in my house. Those people knew that I was serious about this matter. And they left me alone. And you know, now they don't make trouble with me. In fact, anytime I see them now, if I have one minute to see them, they are very glad because they never know they can see my face anymore. They know that I've gone with Jesus Christ. And they know that this deeper life walk is, they know it is my, it is my very life, it is my blood, it is my dream, it is my vision, it is my food, it is my everything. And they say, you cannot see that man. And they have given up. They tried their best. In one of the retreats we held here, not the one I told you in my message the other time, the chief, the king of our whole town, when the people were coming for retreat, said because they couldn't see this man, he came, thinking that if he came to the retreat, he will get my attention. I mean the king of the whole place. And eventually when he came, they came to tell me that, you know, he came to the retreat. I said, give him accommodation. It was a general retreat. And then he brought his chair, you know, because the king cannot sit on ordinary chair. And he put his chair there and I stood, uh, you know, I stayed here and just, you know, stood up and preached the word and, you know, just preached the word as if, you know, nobody, is, nobody knew anything. And then the first day I preached the word, second day I preached the word. Then, uh, you know, by the time we were about to finish it and he wanted to go, he knew that if this man, if I don't try to tell these ushers to, that I need to see him, this man can just go preaching like this. And eventually he came and, you know, saw me and said, you know, bring your headquarters church to the town we will give you land we will give you this we will give you this and all the things we're looking for in lagos they had land and days and days our town will give you everything i said thank you sir then i began to discuss on what it means to be born again and said hi about being born again hi about this hi about this this word of god you are hearing this is the word of god and then we closed the chapter i said bye bye since that time you know since the highest person has come and you know all i am for is for salvation they know that that man is gone and i've gone did you know i've gone i've gone to be with jesus christ but you are still there you have not gone the people see you, the people call you, the people pull you, the people drag you, say, Pastor, what am I going to do? What you are going to do is that you are crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to you. And you carry the cross. You carry the cross. And I enjoy carrying the cross. In fact, I don't even know it is cross anymore. Because it is so wonderful to serve the Lord. It's so wonderful to follow the Lord. So wonderful to abandon the things of the world. And, uh, you know, the things that happen, there are a lot of things that will try to get my attention. 
the old boys of uh, you know old students of the school i went to you know they had all this meeting all this meeting and everything and they've been trying they always write letters to me to come to the meeting to come to the meeting and send minutes of you know so and so opened it to a prayer so and so did this so and so did that oh you you think i don't get uh, yes i get those things and when i you know go through and they put this person's name that person's name then they uh, produce magazine and then one of the members of deeper life here they hooked him uh, they said well since you are part of his church uh, and you are you know a student of that school before go and give all this to him and then they said the price is this and that i got all those things what do you think i'm going to do you think i'm going to begin to run no the world is crucified to me i have a ministry i have a calling and i have you know i'm a man of one goal one direction i don't look here I don't look there. Something they say something wonderful is going on there. I don't know about that. This is the only thing I know to be wonderful. And when you are a person like that, you are not distracted. And people don't pull you here and there. You are crucified to the world, and the world is crucified unto you. I pray it will happen to you from this very day in Jesus' name. You become a conqueror. Conqueror. In Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. From verse 37, Romans 8, 37, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Persecution, affliction, misunderstanding, false doctrine, false teachers flying here and there. You take your stand, you stand your ground. And it says in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Then it said in verse 38, for I'm persuaded. That neither death nor life, neither angels nor principalities, powers nor things to come, nor things present. It says, no height, no death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How I pray that we'll all be conquerors. And he overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. And he loved not their lives even unto death. That means, if you're going to be an overcomer, temptations will come. You say, no, I'm above that now. And all difficulties will come to discourage you and pull you back. You say, no, this is how we know the girls from the women. This is how we know the boys from the men. This is how we know the civilians from the soldiers. You say, that is not going to discourage me. That is not going to pull me back. I am going to stand on the word of God. You are an overcomer. You are more than a conqueror. More than a conqueror. And therefore, nothing, whatever they are doing in the world, whatever is going on here or going on there, whatever the temptation trying to attract you and trying to distract you, you say, no, they will not affect me. I am going to stand. I pray you will stand in Jesus' name. Then as you, as you stand and overcome all these temptations, what will be the reward and the result that leads us to the crown? In Revelation, chapter 3 revelation chapter 3 verse 11 and verse 12 behold i come quickly hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown him that overcometh will i make a pillar in the temple of my god and he shall go no more out and i will write upon him the name of my god and the name of the city of my God, which is in New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. It says, whatever you have, the gospel. What you have, salvation. What you have, holiness and sanctification. What you have, the gift of God, the grace of God in your life. What you have, the entirety of the doctrines of the Bible that have been taught line upon line, precept upon precept. What you have, hold fast that no man take thy crown. That no man take thy crown. I pray nobody will take your crown. Many years ago, persecution against the church, in this particular area I'm talking about now, was very intense, very difficult, and very high. And there were these people that were Christians. And he decided that they were going to kill them. But not by shooting them. They were going to kill them by making them die slowly. And you see that kind of death is very, very painful. If somebody is shot, within a few minutes, the fellow is gone. But this one came with torture because of its being gradual. They put a terrible uh, block 
and uh, you know this kind of block maybe you have not seen that kind over here uh, there are you know there was a particular place i was ministering and because they hauled they used that hall for what they call skating and then they put solid ice on the ground and the ice will look like just the ground where you are now very very solid but because of uh, the uh, meetings we are having, they had to put planks of wood on the solid ice so that people can, you know, still sit down and they put their legs on the uh, solid plank. But then there was somebody that tripped on that ice on the ground. That is in a pile that was not covered. And he broke his knee. I mean, it's solid, solid ice, but very, very cold. So this persecution of these 40 people. They put them in this particular ice, not covered, very cold. And as they just put them there, what will happen is that they will just die away like that. And they put soldiers so that they cannot run away. Soldiers on guard with, uh, their, with their guns. So that those people will just stay there until they are freezed to death, frozen to death. And so these 40 people there, when they first got there because of the persecution, they were holding on and they said they were not going to give up and eventually one of them freezed to death then the next one died then the next one died then the next one died eventually 39 died remaining one do you know it's difficult to stand alone do you know that when there's no encouragement and when there's no fellowship, where you don't hear the word of God like this, do you know you'll think that you are the only one going through what you are going through? It's difficult to stand alone. So this other fellow began to wonder that before life is frozen out of me, maybe I should change my decision. And eventually, one of these soldiers there, he had been looking at what was going on. You know, sometimes God opens the eyes of unbelievers. Like he opened the eyes of Nebuchadnezzar and gave him that dream that Daniel interpreted. Like he opened the eyes of Pharaoh and gave him those two dreams that Joseph interpreted. Like he opened the, uh, the eyes of the wife of um, Pilate and gave her that dream that he eventually said, don't do anything with that innocent man. He opened the eyes of this soldier carrying the gun. And watching over these people that were dying one by one. And he saw that these people immediately they die. The crown will be put on them. And then they fly away. He was saying what? Glorious death. So this last one. When he was alone. And the cold was much. And the hunger was much. And the loneliness was much. And everything was so terrible. And all these other 39 people they had died. He was looking at their bodies like this. Not knowing where they had gone. He told those soldiers, he said, I give up. I can't continue again. I can't endure again. That soldier that God opened his eyes said, you don't want to continue, come out of the ice, let me take your place. And took his place and got his crown. Hold fast what you have that no man will take your crown. We don't know when Jesus is coming. Maybe we've gone, you see sometimes you are traveling a hundred miles and you have traveled 99 miles, it remains only one mile. Maybe you are feeling tired, maybe you are feeling weary, but look at all the distance you have gone, 99 miles already and remaining only one mile. Why don't you say, even if I die, only one mile, I will make it. Why will you allow the devil to take your crown? Here we are. Look at how you have prayed. Look at what God has done in your life. Look at the endurance. Look at what we have suffered already. Look at the hunger. Look at the joblessness. Look at how your family rejected you. And we have come to this point now. Is it at this point where we will say, I cannot continue again? I cannot follow again? Who will take your crown? Who will take the stars out of your crown? Where do you want to spend eternity? How do you want to end your Christian journey? You have borne the cross to this point. Can you not bear the cross for the little space that remains? You have been a conqueror up to this point. Can't you remain a conqueror for the little time that remains so that nobody will take your crown? I pray nobody will take your crown. The devil wants you to lose your life, to lose the crown. But Jesus is saying, my son, my daughter, my child, a little bit more endure. A little bit more endure. A little bit more endure. We shall soon be home. Let's rise up and pray.
bear the cross bear the cross take up your cross and follow Christ and by that cross you are crucified to the world and the world is crucified unto you Whosoever shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Whosoever shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. What is making you to think of looking back? Endure till the end. Endure till the end. Let the Lord meet you at the point of your faithfulness. Let the Lord meet you at the point of your faithfulness. Preach the word, instant in season and out of season. When it is convenient, when it is not convenient. Carry that cross. Endure that cross. Joyfully, joyfully carry the cross. Are you still being attracted by the things of the world? It is by that cross of Jesus Christ you are crucified to the world. And the world is crucified to you. Take the cross and follow the Lord. Stand your ground. Stand your ground. Keep to sound doctrine, the totality of sound doctrine.
Let no man take your crown. Let no man take your crown. Be a conqueror and be more than a conqueror. Young man, don't lose your crown because of marriage. Don't lose heaven because of marriage. And young woman, don't lose your crown, don't you lose your soul, don't lose heaven because of marriage. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Amen.